Chapter 69, entitled Icons in Sound, Taverner, John Taverner, the composer we're going to study, and Postmodern Orthodoxy. So the 20th century is divided into a period before World War II and a period after World War II. And the before is called modernism. And then after World War II is called postmodernism. These are pretty good sized chunks of time. And uh, uh, alongside the concert tradition, composers have continued to write expressive music for their religious communities. So this is still part of the sacred choral music unit in the last chapter in this unit. And it's again from the 20th century, from postmodernism and um, actually from the 1970s. What was the piece? 1985 <laughs> this is the date of the composition we're gonna study. So like the Western Christian tradition, the Greek Orthodox tradition, wait, what are we talking about? Remember we said that the Romans and the Eastern Empire divided into two parts early on, but actually the, the religion carried on the, the Roman Catholic Church. And in the year around 1000, that split also. So there was the Western uh, Roman Catholic Church and then the Eastern part, which became known as the Greek Orthodox or the Russian Orthodox um, Church, which had some significant differences and beliefs uh, compared to the Roman Catholic Church. And the music was different. And the music that they used in the uh, Greek Orthodox Church was based on chant from their area which had been influenced by uh, Arabic culture and their music. Remember when we heard the uh, Arabic chanter singing the uh, call to prayer and how there were microtones in there. So even the chant uh, in the Eastern part of the Roman empire had that Arabic influence in, with microtones. <clears throat> So they both look at this, the Western Christian tradition and the Greek Orthodox tradition has roots in Jewish practice, but it de developed in significantly different ways over the centuries. So English composer, John Tavener, his music employs concepts and specific traits of Orthodox ritual to convey a spiritual intensity that is designed to transcend individual religions another very religious individual. This is an example of minimalists, right? And what does minimalist mean? Well, it's a, something that uses the minimum. And what does minimum mean, right? It means the least amount. The minimum required to have this class make is so many students, right? So that's what a minimum is. And um, from 19, well, it's a, Minimalist sculpture entitled The Chapel of the Holy Ghost radiates a mystical spiritualism. The Chapel of the Holy Ghost. Very interesting. Spiritual minimalism. There were other composers that wrote in this um, concept of music, this philosophy, but it was using minimalism, which has um, long non-pulsed sections and um, modal parallel movement. And we'll, we'll study, because this is actually post-minimalism. When we study minimalism, it's really minimal. <clears throat> Other composers wrote in this uh, spiritual minimalism as well. Goretzky is a Polish composer. Arvo Part is one of the Scandinavian countries. And of course, John Tavener is uh, an American. British composer, sorry, John Tavener is a British composer. Uh, 
English composer, prominent exponent of spiritual minimalism. So for one reason or another, he, he uh, converted to the Greek Orthodox Church. So his style is um, has elements of neo-romanticism. When we see the word neo, it means new, and it's kind of like a recycled uh, original romanticism. aims at timelessness. That's an interesting concept. And try to, try to have that conveyed in music. So he wrote uh, a lot of, most of his music, I believe, is, is the spiritual. So this is kind of a, a style that's not a lot of composers have written in or devoted their, their whole life to, but it uh, it's um, obviously involves liturgy and, 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 uh, and it's sacred music. So again, 1054, the split between the Eastern Church and Western Church. And of course, they're based on a lot of similarities, but some differences. The piece we're going to listen to by John Tavener is called A Hymn to the Mother of God. Again, so many, uh, the, well, this is what, what the, the Catholic Church really has uh, a focus on the Virgin Mary and the Mother of God. This is a very important part of the of the. Would you call that the doxology? And this composition is written for two six voice choirs. Okay. The hymn is from uh, a service that's done in Lent. Uh, Lent, we have Advent and Lent throughout our course, our important times uh, in history. You don't know what they are, right? Lent is six weeks before Easter, and that's what uh, Ash Wednesday starts Lent, and that's when the Mardi Gras is, because it's the last day to party. Actually, they do it about a month now. But, and then Advent is the six weeks before Christmas, when you're supposed to give up something and um, be specially good for those six weeks. So the actual uh, text is from the 8th century that he chose to use. Influences of medieval and Renaissance polyphony. Well, okay. Because I think of that, the way it, it hangs on and carries over into different um, sounds, we'll, we'll notice when we listen to this. Again, recalls, recalls organum and minimalism. So you have one note that's play, uh, uh, being sounded and other notes that go over top and are dissonant and things change slowly from consonance to dissonance. And, um, and this is an example of minimalism. So there are drones, uh, a pitch that doesn't change uh, as you would expect it to change with the harmony. So it it's, stays the same and everything, and the harmony will change in spite of the drone not changing. So we have slow moving counterpoint, and it's, again, it's kind of just slows the, the things down to, for this timelessness. Another Middle Ages type style here with the flat lack of perspective so this piece we're going to listen to is an ABA form we call that ternary 
They're telling it's mystical and chant-like. We're going to, um, after we hear it, we can decide if that's true or not. And they're telling us it alternates homophonic and polyphonic passages. Right? Polyphonic, when you have more than one line and neither of them are, are uh, more important than the other. And homophonic, you have one important line and everything else supports that important line. And it could be inside. It doesn't have to be at the top of the uh, voices being used. And there's a section with the rhythmic canon. Remember, a canon is a uh, complicated, more complicated round is what it is. Like when you sing row, row, row your boat and how the sounds uh, go together is really a polyphony. When you when you have like three parts or, or three people sing row, row, row your boat. And uh, that's an example of a canon. Ends in striking consonants. And then the B section is more chromatic. I encourage you to look at the listening guide. And here it has detailed explanation on section A, what to listen for, section B, and section A prime. When you put A and you have that um, mark up there, that's A prime. And what else does it tell us? It tells us it's homorhythmic, a lot of that, and which means you have a vertical motion, right? They all, everybody moves together. And it says it's uh, syllabic. What does syllabic mean? Right. One syllable for one note is syllabic. Uh, expression is mystical and almost chant-like. For 12 voices and two choirs, right? Soprano, alto, alto, and tenor, bass, bass. Six voices in one choir, and the same in another choir. So we're going to listen for the minimalism, style, and spiritual, and the timelessness. Like, does it make you be introverted and uh, mystical, right? Something that's kind of divine and and not explainable let's listen to the piece it's quite short only like two and a half minutes <laughs> 